All right, good afternoon. This is Mr. Melvin Davis, right? Mr. Davis? Yes, ma'am. You introduce yourself, tell us your name and DOC number, please. Melvin Davis, 314198. All right, Mr. Davis, let me uh, acknowledge the guests that we have here with us and that you have there with you. Here in Baton Rouge, we have Sophie Call and uh, Marlene. Merlin. Merlin. Merlin Renard. Um, to also joining us, we have the Parole Project, Mr. Myers, um, <clears throat> Anita Michelle Davis, Matthew Wells, Donald Davis, Rosalind Ratcliffe, uh, Minnie Robinson, Bobby Stubberfield, Rhonda Davis, there with you, Ashton Falls. Anthony Hill, Danny Davis, also at the penitentiary, Isaac Manuel, Dana Hill, Juan Dabney, uh, Gerald Joseph there with you, as well as Matthew Wells, Ingrid Manuel, and Mary Wells. So we have lots of folks who are participating with us today. First, Mr. Davis, I'm going to read some information into the record, then I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Jackson. See you to my far left. Your case has been assigned to her this morning. And we'll hear from the warden uh, and those folks who've indicated they'd like to speak. You'll be allowed to make a statement before we turn it over to your attorney, Ms. Myers. Ms. Myers, would you like to in introduce yourself for the record, please? Yes, ma'am. Amy Myers on behalf of Parole Project. Um, and I'd love to make a brief comment at the end. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you. So, Mr. Davis, you're here seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in Jefferson Parish. Uh, in 1996, you received a life sentence for a second degree murder conviction. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I did not acknowledge that we do have a representative from the DA's office in Jefferson Parish who wants to speak, and we'll call on him also. Would you uh, answer Mrs. Jackson's questions? Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Davis. How are you? I'm fine. Good. That's good. That's good. Um, how old are you, Mr. Davis? 49. And how much time have you actually served uh, in this case? 29 years. So you were 20? Yes, ma'am. This crime? Yes, ma'am. So tell us something about what was going on in your life when you were 20. What were you in school? What was your job? Just Tell us about your, your life at 20. Um, yes, ma'am. I didn't have a job at that time. Um, I was a 20-year-old crack addict. Um, I didn't have a place to stay. I didn't have a job. I didn't have an education. I was living on my brother's couch at that time. Well, when did you start using drugs? How did you become a 20-year-old crack addict? I started using drugs at the age of 13. I started smoking marijuana. And at the age of 16, I was introduced to crack cocaine. Who made the introduction? I, I didn't hear that. Introduced oh, my brother did. And was this an older brother? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, is he the one who was involved in this crime with you? Yes, ma'am. What about your parents? Where were your parents? It was home, but they didn't tolerate my activity. Okay, so you actually had a place you could have gone, but you chose not to do that because they did not approve of your uh, lifestyle. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, how far did you go in school? To the seventh grade. And how? why did you only go to the seventh grade? Um, I dropped out of school and I was sentenced to the juvenile detention center in Baton Rouge. Okay, so you got in trouble when you were in the seventh, how old were you in the seventh grade? Um, I was like 13, ma'am. And you got in trouble and while you were in the seventh grade? Yes, ma'am. What kind of trouble was that? Um, I got, uh, got, uh, Put out of school from smoking marijuana. All right. Well, go to court and pick up a charge as a juvenile? 
Yes, ma'am. I had two uh, possession of stolen property charges. All right. And you uh, came to Baton Rouge to uh, LTI? Yes, ma'am. How long did you stay there? 18 months. You had a GED while you were there? No, ma'am. Um, did you make any efforts? Were any uh, classes offered? Yes, ma'am. It was offered. I was actually attending school, but um, by the time that I was released, I was unable to complete it. Okay. And when you got out of uh, LTI, where did you go? I started, I went and got a job permit to start working at McDonald's. And I, started, work. I was uh, 15, right at 16 years old. And so you got a job permit, you went to work at McDonald's. Who were you living with? Oh, my parents. Okay. Um, and when did you pick up your conviction as your first conviction as an adult? I was living with my parents. I had a possession of stolen property charge. I had a stolen motor vehicle. Okay. And did you get probation or did you go to jail? I went to jail. I um I received probation for that uh that crime. Okay. Uh so who were you living with when this crime was committed? I was living with my brother. Why weren't you living with your parents? Because of the lifestyle that I was living, I couldn't live there. They permitted that. Okay, so you had a job, you got out of LTI, you had a job, went, started living with your parents. So at what point did you uh, go back to your old lifestyle? Basically, right after I got out of LTI. I wasn't doing that well then. I was still um, using drugs immediately after I got out of LTI. And I okay. was still using drugs up until my day of me being arrested for this charge. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and talk about uh, January 15th, 1994. Tell us what happened. On that day, my brother, put together a plan to ride the occupants of 1348 Myrtle Street. Um, after he found out they had a large amount of drugs at that residence, he decided that he needed some help. So he asked me, I originally said no, because I didn't want to have anything to do with that. I was just, I just put in the application to um, be a baker at McKenzie's Bakery at that time. But I changed my answer to yes. So, not only did I agree, my co-defendant Cedric agreed as well. So we got in the car and went round to the residence. Linda Robinson was standing outside. And as we got out of the car, my brother placed the gun on her as we approached the door and had her to knock on the door before we can enter. Uh, my co-defendant Cedric Gibbon handed me a nine millimeter handgun. As we entered the residence, um, everybody was placed on their knees, and my co-defendant said of giving took Cynthia Robbins to the black to look for the, uh, the drugs that was inside of the residence. As he came out of the back, and he said, I have everything, but he called my brother's name. And when he called my brother's name, he was leaving out of the door. And as he was... Who called your brother's name? My co-defendant said of giving. All right. He called so he called his name. Yes, ma'am. And when he called him by name, Rod Johnson said, that's okay, we know who y'all are anyway. So as my co-defendant was leaving the residence, Rod Johnson jumped up and he started to run. When he started running, I started shooting at him. As he ran and disappeared oh. out of the house. Oh, why did he start shooting at him? I didn't know what he was going to get a gun or what. I didn't know. I, I was nervous at that time. I didn't know what was going on? I was acting off an impulse, and I just started shooting at him, ma'am. Now, four people were actually shot, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And one, um, uh, a 15 year old was the one who actually died, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Who shot the 15 year old? My brother did. 
Okay. Let's talk about um, Miss. Did you say Linda Johnson? Is that her name? Linda oh, Robinson. Robinson. You shot Miss Robinson and two other people. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about your shooting of Miss Robinson. Why did you shoot her? Yes, ma'am. At that time, when John Hawkins started to run and I started shooting at him, I looked and I seen Ms. Robinson heading towards the door. And when I saw Ms. Robinson heading towards the door, I started shooting her and shooting at her as well, striking her 22 times. Even clearly, I can see that she was pregnant. And I, as I turned and looked, I seen. Oh, wow. Well. You shot it, you shot, you fired 25 shots into Ms. Robinson's body. According to the police report, let me pull it up. According to Ms. Robinson's statement to the police at the time, she identified you as the person who stood over her and shot con and continuously shot her. So she wasn't running when she got shot. She was down on the floor. You stood over her and you pumped 25 bullets into her midsection. Uh, she was seven months pregnant and you shot her over 20 times. Isn't that the way it happened? Yes, ma'am. But that's not what you just told the board. And I will tell you, Mr. Uh, Davis, Honesty at this point is the best thing that you can do. Uh, and your efforts to minimize this really horrible crime doesn't serve you very well. This lady was down on the ground, seven months pregnant, and according to the report, she had injuries over 25% of her body. So all of those bullets were concentrated in her midsection and she was obviously pregnant. So why would you do that? Yes, ma'am. At that time in my life, I was addicted to crack cocaine. I was acting off of impulse. I just, my life just was constantly spinning out of control. But that's not the person that I am today. Well, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But again, you know, four people shot, 15 year old died, a uh, seven month old fetus was killed inside uh, the mother's womb. And miraculously, she survived being shot in excess. And there are other people in the house, but nobody went to the excess that you did. You know, no, nobody else shot as many people or showed so much disregard for human life as you did. So help us understand. Okay. At that, yes, ma'am. At that time in my life, I was acting off a low impulse. Between the drugs, not sleeping, constantly using drugs on top of days, on top of days without any rest, my life just was a total mess. I had no control of myself at all. I just wanted the drugs out of the house and I just wanted to leave. I wasn't thinking at all at that time. Well, let's talk about uh, your drug addiction and what kind of programs you've taken uh, to address what, according to you, uh, 
or the situation that had taken over your life. So tell us all the drug treatment programs that you've been involved in. Yes, ma'am. AA, substance abuse, and NA, ma'am. That's it? Yes, ma'am. That was all the only programs that I have um, available oh. to me at this moment. Well, but you've been in prison for uh, 29 years. I'm sorry, yeah. 29 years. They had to have been available to you prior to this moment as you describe it. I mean, yes. I have, yes, ma'am, I have taken them throughout the course of the years. And right now, I'm actually still going to NA and AA meetings twice a week. Okay. Well, anything else? That's it. I constantly um, mentor other guys as well because of the drug well, addiction. You know, I want to talk about uh, what kind of treatment you were in a uh, a, a drug treatment program at Angola, right? Yes, ma'am. And what was that program? That's the um, substance abuse program. That was initially. Tell us about it. Does it have a name? Oh, uh, just basically, uh, it was the Phelps uh, substance abuse program that was at Camp C at that time. How long? That how long was that program? The program was um it was a three month course that I went through um to receive okay. the drug treatment. So you had a three month course, and then you did some AA and NA. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and you completed that substance abuse program in two thousand. Does that sound about right? Yes, ma'am. All right. And tell us about your participation in AA or NA. Well, AA, um, once I started AA, after I completed AA, I went to NA. Oh, okay. When did you do AA? I didn't did hear you, you ma'am. When did you do the AA program? AA was in 2000. 2015, and I did it again in 2016. Okay. And since then? Yes, ma'am. I constantly um, attend uh, AA meetings twice a week. And what have you gotten out of those programs? I actually was going to understand. Consider yourself an addict today. Yes, ma'am. I know that once an addict, I'm always an addict. And I constantly. How do you feel? How, how do you um, address that? If you ever release, how do, how do you assure that you're not going to go back to a life of drugs and addiction? I constantly surround myself around positive people. And I make a conscious decision every day not to get high. And I also attend the weekly meetings twice a week to make sure that I don't fall back into that category that I once were. Think power is enough? Ma'am? Think willpower is enough? No, ma'am. I know continuance through prayer and going attending AA meetings NA meetings, I know that I can do it through there. Uh, you have children? No, oh, ma'am. I see you took inside out dads and Malachi dads. Why did you take those programs? Yes, ma'am, because I have nieces and nephews. And I wanted to make sure those, those same values that I'm learning that I can pass it on to them. And uh, what's your current job at facility? Yes, ma'am. I am uh, right now. I'm currently an inmate counselor. I have been at, been holding that job for nine years now. Um, okay. that job consists of me um, filing legal grievances, um, DB court, um, legal interviews. Um, 
guys and uh, trusted with me to make sure that I do the right thing with confidentiality, make sure that I don't say anything about their cases if they may have co-defendants or anything like that. Uh, what other jobs have you had? I had, um, I actually used to work in a laundry, ma'am, for eight years. I worked in a cell block. I worked at a healthcare only to make sure guys would be able to get in and out of the shower, get on it, get to the call outs. Um, what they need to be. What's your trustee status? A class A trustee, ma'am. How long have you had that status? For eight years. I see that you've had 12 write-ups. Is that yes. correct? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember when your last write-up was? Yes, ma'am. 2015. What was that for? For aggravated disobedience. I had oh, head, go ahead. I had headphones on during the count, and they recounted, and I had the headphones on, and I didn't hear that it was a recount, and I was found. They found me, and they wrote me up and locked me up behind that. But however, since then, I don't wear headphones anymore during count time. Um, what about the you have lots of opposition. Um, you can't control, uh, I would tell you, the current judge, the DA, the sheriff's office, the victim's aunt, the victim's brother, uh, and other members, uh, and the victim's father had no comment, and there was a sister who was not opposed, uh, but you do have uh, some opposition. So tell us, why do you think that we should um, grant relief today? Because I'm no longer the same person that I once were. I have taken the necessary steps to change my life. I realized that I made a lot of mistakes in my life and I couldn't continue to live the same way that I was living. So I started taking programming and try to do everything that I can to make sure that I never fall back into that same place that I once were at that time. I know that through programming, it helps. I know that being a responsible citizen comes with a responsibility to aid in society and build up society and want the same thing that I want for myself that I should want for others. Um, where's your brother? Um, my brother, they have one on the screen. Dream, um, oh. Zoom, that's looking Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I mean, um, Ronnie Davis, he's down the wall uh, in the, on the West Shore, East Shore. Okay. Now, I saw some a letter from uh, Mary Wells. Is that your mom? Yes, ma'am. Well, in her letter, she says you were wrongfully convicted. Why, did she, why do you think she feels that way? I don't know, ma'am, maybe because of the way that um, it's proud of this, uh, feel that I didn't receive a fair trial, I'm thinking. Well, but you actually killed, I mean, you didn't kill the young boy who died, but you shot three other people and uh, killed a baby before it was born. So why did she think you wrongfully convicted i can say that yes ma'am i would say that because of, of i have i have tried over several years to get certain legal documents and i think that played a part in that as she felt that i was uh, wrongly convicted because of the documents that i was trying to obtain that she wasn't able to obtain do you feel like you do you feel like you were wrongfully convicted oh no ma'am not at all. I know that I'm guilty. And you've acknowledged that to your mother? Yes, yeah, she knows that I'm guilty. Everybody that's sitting behind me, ma'am, know that I'm guilty of this crime. So if you were successful, uh, what would be your transition plan? Yes, ma'am. I would be transitioning to the parole project maybe three to four weeks to uh, receive programming 
Then after that, I would be living with my sister at 3733 Blanchard Drive in Chermet. She would be responsible for bringing me to and from work. I'd be working at um, Davis Catching Transportation. While I'm working there, I'll be saving money to attain my CDL's driver's license. I actually started a CDL trucking school here in Angola. But when it closed down in West Yard, I was um, unable to con continue to contend. But also I have the opportunity to attend Operation Sparks to become a full stack junior software developer because of my master certification in computer fundamentals. I saw that you did get that and you also got your GED. And yes, so ma'am. Like, yes, ma'am. Well, um, on those accomplishments. All right, this is Renata, so that's all I have. Oh, I'm sorry, Warren, what could you tell us about uh, Mr. Davis? Um, Mr. Davis is a, a MA counsel, uh, minimum A uh, trustee, uh, and everything else that you said is true. He also participated in Malachi Dad, which is a great program here. Um, and it's tied with low. Okay. All right. Thank you. This is not that's all I have. Thank you. All right. We'll hear from uh, the folks who are here in support. First, we'd like to hear from uh, Mr. Davis' sister, Ms. Anita Michelle Davis. You can say that. Yeah. Okay. Just talk loud. Good afternoon. My name is Anita Michelle Davis. I am the youngest sibling. Uh, my mother Mary and I have to be blatantly honest with you today. That has been very difficult for me to hear because I had never heard this story before. And for me, I want to extend an apology. Because I feel like as his sister, knowing what he had been, what he was going through at the time, I feel like I failed him. And I know I am only a year older than him, but in my heart, I wish I could have done more to save my brother from the crime that he committed. Oh, no. But I know my brother has a good heart, and I know that he is capable of loving. And I just ask that from the bottom of my heart, if there's any way that he can be forgiven and he can be for intimacy today. I do wish that I didn't have to hear this because I didn't. And I don't see my brother in that light. He has always been loving and caring unto me. And that somehow, as he was supposed to be granted clemency, I would take him into my home and I would provide for him food, clothes, and shelter just to make sure that he is. Um, introduced back into society. And I would see to it that he goes to the classes or whatever it is that he needs to go to, that he could be productive. I have um, a plan for him. I want him to create a vision board. And I just want him to have a productive life. So I can say it. Because this really hurts. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We do appreciate your comments. Um, Rosalind Radcliffe, please. Like on trees. The other side. There you go. Is Excuse me, Rosalind cannot log in. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can we hear now, though, from uh, Ashton Falls, nephew? Actually, um, Matthew Wells, um, Melvin's stepfather, was going to be the other live speaker. Please, Chairman. Okay. Well, we'll hear from Mr. Wells. 
Good afternoon. You have to stand up. Good afternoon to everybody here. My name is Matthew Webb, and I'm Larry Davis' stepfather. And I just come here that you all know that there's been a change in his life. And he don't no longer desire to do those things that he did. And he has he admitted his wrong done, and he's a better man now. And he, uh, Really, why I enjoy speaking for him because he's a born again Christian. His life has been changed. The thing he used to do, he don't do those things no more because he have God guiding in his life. And I just like for y'all to like him another chance to be out in the free world to make a better man out of himself. The whole thing that passed, that passed away in his life, and all things have become new. So I want to thank this prisoner for what they have done for him. And I want to thank his lawyer for representing him today. And I want to thank, I want to congratulate Melvin for putting the work in that he has put in to come home to his family. And today I would just love to see y'all help him in that area if you could find enough love in your heart to do so. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Do we hear from Mr. Myers, Parole Project? Yes, good afternoon. Kerry Myers, Louisiana Parole Project. Mr. Mr. Davis is a client of Parole Project. Uh, we support his, uh, we'll support him through his transition uh, should he get a recommendation today. Um, I'd like to point out that, that at his age, at right now, right at 50 years old, Mr. Davis is at a critical point in his life where he's very viable. Uh, uh, to, to be in uh, employment. Uh, he has an opportunity uh, to contribute to his community. He has, he's also about to complete a Braille transcriber certification. Uh, we have one client currently now that just got two job offers, uh, job offers with that same certification. So that also makes him uh, uh, very employable. Um, you can see the difference between the 20 year old uh, drug addicted Mr. Davis and the 50 year old Mr. Davis today, and the commitment and the work that he's done on himself. Uh, he has tremendous support. Um, he has parole project to help him through his transition. Uh, we will make sure that he goes through all the evaluations uh, that are needed um, through mental health and substance abuse evaluations. We know that he will comply. He's already told you that, that his sobriety is extremely important to him, that he will continue to go to meetings. Um, and he will follow any other recommendations. I know that that uh, through those evaluations, uh, he'll also learn the skills that he needs. He'll have the peer support that he needs from people uh, who have already been through what he has been through, uh, through the steps, uh, or what he will go through, who has already been through there, knows the obstacles and knows how to navigate those obstacles. Uh, so that way he will have the best possible chance of success. Uh, so with our support and support of his family, um, and the and the work that Mr. Davis has done to become the person he is today, we ask this board uh, to consider his application and grant his relief today. Thank you. All right, uh, this time we'll hear from the DA's office, Mr. Meyer. Good afternoon, Randall Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. Um, this one of the few cases we've had where we have, I think, three Myers involved. And I believe none of us, uh, there's no relation between any of the three. Um, we're opposed at this time to Mr. Uh, Davis's request for a commutation of sentence. This was a, you know, he was on supervision at the time of the offense. Uh, it was a home invasion where four people were shot and, and pretty horrific crime where he, he stood over somebody and shot him over 20 times in, in killing an unborn child. Um, we feel that 29 years is, clearly not sufficient time for him to have served for this horrific crime. And there's very strong victim opposition. Um, I, I spoke with some of the victims last week and they had told me that they were gonna appear today, but apparently something occurred and they were not able to appear. Um, so for those reasons, we were opposed to his request for commentation. Thank you, we appreciate your input. 
All right, uh, Mr. Davis, is, before we turn it over to Ms., uh, your attorney, is there anything you'd like to say to us? Yes. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. I thank this board for this opportunity to be able to speak my truth here today. And I'd like to tell the board that I'm no longer the same person that I once were. My life has made a tremendous change. Through programming and education, I have totally realized now that there's another way of looking at life. I don't have to, I don't have to continue to do the things that I once was doing. I know through education, there's more opportunities. And I never would have thought that I would have had the opportunity to actually be a Braille transcriber. I never thought I'd have the opportunity to get a GED. I never thought I would have the opportunity to have a master's certification, have the opportunity to attend Operation Sparks, to, be, to, to become a full stack junior software developer. I never had those opportunities. I realized right now in my life that I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And I know that I'm very, very sorry for that. I know that I hurt a lot of people. I even hurt my own family. I tore them apart as well as the victim's family. And I apologize to everyone that is involved that I committed a crime against. I, I, I apologize to the community as well. And I thank this board for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Myers. Thank you. Melvin made a series of poor decisions as a teenager from selling drugs as a 13 year old right up to agreeing to his brother Ronnie's plan to rob the victims in this case. Melvin had to face his moral failings and decide who he wanted to become. Today, he's a trusted and respected member of the LSP community, an inmate counselor with the highest ranking trustee level. Melvin is a long way away from the 20 year old, angry, uneducated man who committed this terrible crime. Melvin worked very, very hard to obtain his GED, which he got in 2018 something that did not come easily like it does for some people. Um, Melvin is trusted and reliable. The role of inmate counsel substitute for nine years is an incredibly difficult role that requires not only legal skill, but also great compassion. Melvin is a positive influence on other inmates here at LSP and he encourages others to further their education as he has gotten so much benefit himself. For example, Another inmate, Robert Lee McKee, wrote that Melvin was instrumental in him getting into the Braille certification transcriber program because he felt inspired by Melvin. Uh, as Kerry said, if Melvin is released, he will be one of the few people in Louisiana that is a certified Braille transcriber, a very sought after skill. Uh, Melvin's 15 years sober and he is very strong in his sobriety and he has a plan if he's released to continue his NA um, in Chalmette with his sister Anita, who you heard from today. Uh, on behalf of the Davis family, Parole Project and all of Melvin's friends, we respectfully pray you recommend Melvin for a commutation of sentence to 60 years. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, no, I'd like to move for executive session. Okay. We have a motion and second. First executive session. Uh, can you call the roll? Sure. Yes. 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 All right. We have an anonymous vote. We'll be in executive session for a few moments to discuss confidential matters. Sorry, I had a hard time getting on the screen. I got to tell you, it's, uh, and we have a transcript, not from him, from his brother, that we can go over, although there's not a ton in it after this, but. Could you imagine being an attorney You, you have to come up with what good can you say about someone who shot a woman more than 20 times, a pregnant woman lying on the floor. What she says is, 
he made mistakes up from when he was 12 years old selling drugs to when he agreed to do this robbery with his brother. And that statement is so callous. That's not the mistake that we're talking about. We're talking about shooting a pregnant woman in her belly more than 20 times. How does someone do that? And when we go over the transcript, what you see, they went into this house to rob it. They had masks on. They, they actually successfully stole everything. And only then did they open fire. Who shoots a pregnant woman a defenseless pregnant woman 20 times and she lived, which is just. Randy. Well, we have three Myers, the D assistant DA, Randy Meyer, he, he said that the that the victims were going to come and something came up and they couldn't and who knows why but it could be it's just too traumatizing we see people come here with ptsd from getting robbed that are just have never really recovered getting shot more than 20 times and losing your unborn child And he lied through his teeth. He gets up there and says, everyone knows I'm guilty. But then meanwhile, his sister breaks down in tears. She had no idea of how tragic this crime was. She's probably gone living her entire life thinking that her brother was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Imagine finding out that your brother unloaded Either he, he reloaded a magazine or he had an extended magazine. To mag dump a pregnant woman lying helplessly on the floor. That's what you find out who your brother is. I wonder what they're considering. How do you let someone out? that can do something like that and not even accept responsibility. His mother wrote to the board saying he's innocent. I believe that he's been telling her he's innocent. And the proof is in the fact that his sister said it there, right there, she had no idea. I... I, you never know with this board, you just don't. Let's find out. Let's skip ahead. It's quite a long way, I really do wonder what it is they're discussing. All right, we are back in regular session and we are prepared to vote. Um, Mrs. Jackson will be voting first. All right, Mr. Davis, I'm going to be honest with you. This has been a very difficult case for me because this was just a horrible, horrible crime. Horrible. Uh, even though you weren't the one who actually shot a 50-year-old, you are equally as guilty because you were involved in everything that happened. And then your own actions 
absolutely uh, inexcusable. Absolutely inexcusable. Um, but, you know, you have accomplished quite a bit uh, over the course of the last almost 30 years. You only had two write ups, the last being in 2015. You have done some um, good programming. Uh, you have um, a good support system with uh, your family and the Kowal project. And while there is some opposition, uh, you know, the victim's sister, and this is apparently the 15 year old guy, she's unopposed, and his father chose to make no comments. And so, um, in light of your rehabilitative efforts over the last uh, 30 years and your conduct record, uh, my vote today would be to recommend a commutation sentence to 60 years. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Olson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Davis. I listened to the interview intently with Ms. Jackson. I, I knew that you had been a constant substitute for nine years. So you've been legally advising and representing people in this very thing and other legal matters. You're represented by one of the best legal agencies that I know in the state. The Louisiana Parole Project and, and Attorney Marks. And I know they advised you and gave you counsel that today was a day of complete truth, complete responsibility. And I repeatedly, repeatedly heard you say, I didn't know exactly what I was doing. I was acting on impulse. I was on drugs. But you had enough uh, bearings and you knew exactly what you're doing. When you went to the house, you had a gun and you robbed and stood over a pregnant woman and shot her in the exact place her abdomen a midsection 20 times. He knew exactly what you did. All you had to do today is tell the complete truth, take full responsibility for your action. You didn't do that today. You made excuse after excuse, and that doesn't sit well with me based on a lack of full responsibility, based on adamant opposition from the whole legal community in Jefferson Parish, nature of the crime and the victim's family is adamantly opposed. My vote is to deny your request based on everything I just articulated. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Davis, uh, all of our cases are hard. Your case presents a, a, a very difficult decision. I, I've listened uh, to what you had to say. I've listened to all of my colleagues. And I think that's the, the way our process works. Is we all come away maybe with different impressions and different opinions. Uh, after listening to your interview today, uh, I'm willing to take a chance on you. I agree with Judge Jackson. I vote would be to uh, recommend to the governor that you commute your sentence to 60 years. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, echoing what Mr. Marabella and Jackson both said, uh, it is a tough case, and, and, and you know. I don't know, I was torn both ways, but my vote today will be to grant and commute to 60. All right, uh, 
Mr. Davis, there's no question. I think we can all agree this was a horrendous crime. This is a very difficult decision. Uh, you know, there's lots of suffering that your family, the victim's family, all the victims family. Um, but I think you've done some good work um, since you've been in jail. My vote today would also be would make the recommendation for Senate if you need to 60 years. So um, you've received one vote that was not favorable, but four votes that were favorable. So we'll make that recommendation <laughs> on your behalf to the Good luck. Thank you, ma'am. What can you say? Mr. Roche, I think, uh, said exactly what I was feeling. It confuses me sometimes. A lot of times, these hearings, it's almost, you know, it is, remember, this is a commutation hearing. They need to make a recommendation to the governor, and the governor uh, may be inclined not to give uh, a commutation because it is not a unanimous ruling. And you know, you give a governor a reason not to, and he may take may take you up on it. So you, you still don't know if the governor will commute. And then once he does, it could even be another couple of years till he gets a parole hearing. And I mean we've seen uh, it could still take a long time. And then it could be that the victims change their minds and show up to the parole hearing and maybe it has some type of influence. Although we did hear that some of the some of the relatives of the deceased didn't mind, but you know, as as Randy Randy Meyer uh, mentioned, he had spoken to the victims and they were opposed, but they, they couldn't make it today, and it could be for any number of reasons, emotional distress could be one of them. It's interesting how it just seems that they that Mr. O'Shea had a whole different like perspective, saying that there are victim opposition, and everyone else is like, oh, Ms. Renas is like, there's no victim opposition. And I was like, what? Okay, so. January. Now, this is the, and thank you, Richard, for sharing this. This belongs to his brother, the brother who he blamed this whole thing on, not him. Um, but it kind of shares roughly. So, January 24th, 1994. Johnson and Miss Robinson's 12 year old uh, niece, Cynthia, at 1348 Myrtle Street, a home rented by Linda Robinson's sister. Um, testified that crack was used and sold at this location. So it's like a drug house. The defendant came to Myrtle Street three times that day. Wow, he went to the house three times. According to Ms. Robinson's testimony, Mr. Johnson on the defendant's third visit to the home was accompanied by his brother, yours truly. And all three of these men were armed and each wore a mask. Further, all witnesses testified that they knew who these men were regardless of the masks. Uh, so they knew who they were regardless of the masks, okay. Well, I mean, he was there three times that day, probably fiending. After robbing the occupants of the house, according to the record, the Davis brothers opened fire. So see, they already robbed them. Then they opened fire. And they shot Miss Robinson 22 times, killing her seven-month-old fetus. And again, the 22 times thing is uh, what's in because I do believe they make a 20-round magazine for a Glock. I don't know of a 22-round, and that's why you know did he actually reload. And I think it does add to it if he did. It's just, anyways. Um, according to the forensic 
uh, pathologist, Sean Brown, who was the 15 year old. So he died by a shotgun blast to the head, which is just so barbaric and violent. You know, it's interesting in World War I, the GIs came with a trench gun, which was the pump action shotgun. And the, the, the violence from that pump action, well, they're pretty much from that shotgun that the the u.s brought to world war one trenches was it was so profound it was so violent that the germans actually um objected to it and said it was i forget the words they use but it was uh it it, it, it was breaking the rule the, the rules of warfare of course and and they actually made a ruling that any anyone found with a shotgun or ammunition for it could be shot on the spot. That's just an example of how violent a shotgun is and what it will do to someone when it hits them in the head. And it's just another level to, to think to go inside of that house uh, as a medics, police officers, just those lives it had affected. It would have been a bloodbath. It would have been something you couldn't have imagined out of the worst kind of movie. And he was in that house. He pulled the trigger on a pregnant woman. And as Mr. Roche said, he didn't take responsibility. I'll put the link in the description, but this is pretty much it. He didn't take responsibility. And he hasn't been taking responsibility. His mother wrote to the board that her son is innocent. His sister was crying because it was the first time she heard what had happened. And then the board gave a recommendation for commutation. And I don't understand it because it's so contrary and hypocritical to what they have done so many times, which is saying you, you might have done great, but you haven't accepted responsibility. And until you do that, you can't get out. And that's how I feel. I want to see people become free. I he was but how can you accept that someone has changed if they don't take accountability if they haven't within themselves accepted who they were when they did their crime what they did he was passing blame to his brother he was passing blame, as Mr. Roche said, to everything. And even his attorney said that the mistake that he made was agreeing to do the robbery with his brother. No, that wasn't the mistake that he made. The mistake, well, it was one of them, but it was shooting her 22 times, as Mr. Roche said, just where the baby was. Seven-month-old baby. Should be a murder sentence, in my opinion. As we said, the governor still needs to sign off on it. When he does have his parole hearing, if the governor signs off on it, we'll cover it here. If it happens, when it happens. This is my opinion. How do you feel? I 
that's it. With that, I'll let you go.